So folks, what I have for you in this one is something that's long overdue. It is people in the mainstream media snapping and finally giving Trump what he deserves, finally giving him that smack in the face that he deserves, that real sense that this man is a danger and that you don't really get anywhere covering him as a typical candidate. You can't ignore him. He is newsworthy. He is running for president. He is facing life in prison effectively as a former president. He is, by definition, newsworthy. But you can't just treat him like he's a normal candidate like Joe Biden or like Republican Republicans of the past. He is different and this fascist monster is starting to awaken people. So I have three examples for you. One, tearing into his awful conduct. Two, really going into this idea, tearing down Trump's own BS idea that all of the cases against him are weak and without merit. And finally, going into Donald Trump's fascistic arguments that he and his movement are above the law. And we start with those and we end with Jake Tapper doing exactly that. Hit the like and subscribe button. It's the single best thing you can do to help this channel grow and spread our message and watch all of this because you're going to see people snap on this fascist orange monster. Behind the scenes, including a moment that sent the former president into a fit of rage. Roberta Kaplan was representing E. Jean Carroll in her defamation trial that ended last Friday. And during the lead up to that trial, Trump sat with her legal team for a deposition at Mar-a-Lago. I'll let Kaplan explain what happened when it came time for lunch. And you could kind of see the the wheel spinning in his brain. You could really almost see it. And he said, well, you're here at Mar-a-Lago. What do you think you're going to do for lunch? Where are you going to get lunch? And so I said to him, well, you know, I, I raised this question with your attorneys yesterday, sir. And they graciously offered to provide us with lunch. At which point there was a huge pile of documents, exhibits sitting in front of him. And he took the pile and he just threw it across the table. That was on the podcast. George Conway explains it all. And I'm joined now by George Conway. So please explain it all for us. Well, I, I can't really explain it because I've never heard of anything like that before. It is a very common practice that when you are hosting a deposition, uh, your counsel provides lunch for everyone else. And they provide lunch in a, usually in a separate conference room so that, they, that both sides can have uh, confidential conversations. And in this particular instance, uh, the, the deposition was held at Mar-a-Lago for Donald Trump's convenience. So it would have been perfectly understandable and it was perfectly understandable that Alina Haba and the team of lawyers representing Trump ordered lunch for their adversaries. The same courtesy would be extended if the, if the shoe were on the other foot. And he went bananas because of that. And he started screaming, as, as Robbie Kaplan describes, he, he was screaming at Alina Haba. Tough client there. There was this other moment as I was listening to this whole conversation, and it's obviously not just getting my attention, but also everyone else's. I want people to, to just listen to that. We come in the room and I say, I'm done asking questions. And immediately I hear from the other side, off the record, off the record, off the record. Um, so they must have planned it. And he looks at me from across the table and he says, see you next Tuesday. You could tell they was like, it was like a kind of a joke again, like teenage boys would come up with. Yeah, but again, no, that, that is a teenage boy level joke. Okay, George, this is cable, but yeah, we I, I'm keep not going to spell it out. But but I mean, what did you think when you were sitting there listening to that? I mean, it, it's just appalling. I mean, he's a pig, and the fact that he was president of the United States makes it all the more. Uh, distressing. I mean, it was misogynistic. I mean, it's, it's to call a woman that to her face and and trying to be cute about it. I mean, it, it was just disgraceful and 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 the kind of of indecent conduct that you wouldn't expect in any adult. I mean, it was just. I, I wouldn't even say it was teenage boy level conduct. It was just utterly, utterly childish. And it, you know, it's not that surprising that Trump does this. I mean. We we know we've seen him do all sorts of crude and uh, uh, things over time, and I, it brought to mind this incident that occurred 
in the Roosevelt Room, I think it was, in, in the fall of 2019, where Donald Trump was congratulating a pair of female astronauts who had conducted an EVA, a, a spacewalk outside the space shuttle, and it was the first all-female EVA. And Trump made a mistake. He said, oh, this is the first time a woman's ever been outside the space shuttle. And then the astronaut, the female astronaut, gently corrected him, and he clearly was taken aback. It was a very gentle, very respectful correction. And he starts to, to touch his forehead as if to scratch an itch, but he used his middle finger. And, and there was this huge controversy. What, was he really giving the finger to these astronauts? And people gave him the benefit of the doubt. But I, I find it hard to give him the benefit of the doubt after seeing all of this conduct. George Conway, it was a, a fascinating conversation and to hear from her on the behind the scenes. Uh, thank you for coming on again. You. you are now a source regular. Thanks for coming on tonight. <laughs> Happy to be here. Also tonight, we're following another court case. This is the fate of Jennifer. Case. So speaking of that case, the Washington Post today ran a headline I thought was interesting. They called it the runt of the Trump cases. Because a lot of people believe that this is the weakest of the cases. It's the one that involves perhaps the least serious allegations against him. Absolutely Not incorrect. N incorrect. I just take no issue with that. This case involves Donald Trump basically defrauding the voters in the 2016 election. That's what it says right up front in the uh, statement of facts for that indictment. So do you think this is a strong case? Because the, the, the issue is that even... People who do not like Donald Trump at all worry that this case on its merits, the one in New York with Alvin Bragg, is not as strong as some of the other cases. Oh, I think it's easily as strong as the other cases. You've got two accomplice witnesses. You've got Michael Cohen and you've got David Pecker from the National Enquirer, both of whom are going to corroborate each other about the scheme that Donald Trump had in order to try and pay off these various women to keep them from telling their stories before the 2016 election. The whole point was after the Access Hollywood tape, Donald Trump could not afford to have other people coming out and basically saying the same thing that he said on tape. So this, this case is extremely important. They're corroborated by a tape between Michael Cohen and Donald Trump, where Donald Trump is on tape actually directing Michael Cohen to make out a check relating to Karen McDougal, the other woman that they're paying off. And you've got all of these documents and other witnesses that are going to corroborate each of these witnesses. The, the core of what might come in all those other cases, we were just showing the timetable here. Right. It is like a minefield of legal cases for Donald Trump. But at the heart of it, Try to put their argument to something of a stress test. Could a president who ordered SEAL Team 6 to assassinate a political rival who was not impeached, would he be subject to criminal prosecution? If he were impeached and convicted first. And so, so your answer is, is no. Is, my answer is qualified, yes. There is a political process that would have to occur. The answer was no. That person would not be prosecutable. To translate that from the legalese, Trump's lawyers are arguing Trump as president could order an assassination of a political rival using SEAL Team 6 without prosecution unless he is first impeached by the House and then convicted by the Senate. And that prompts this question. If a President Trump were to order the assassination of a political rival using SEAL Team 6, would a majority of the House of Representatives vote to impeach him? Would there be 67 U.S. senators willing to vote to convict him? Let's restate this. According to Trump and his team, he could use the U.S. military to assassinate a political rival, and he could escape prosecution if 34 senators, Republicans, were willing to acquit him for such an action. That prompted this from Democratic Senator Brian Schatz of Hawaii. Do you think 34 United States senators stand ready to vote to acquit? I don't know, honestly. I don't know. Eight years ago, less than two weeks before the Iowa caucus of 2016, Donald Trump famously praised the loyalty of his supporters by saying this. I could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and I wouldn't lose any voters, okay? It is not difficult to imagine Trump getting votes 
from his ride or die congressional supporters, the ones who helped pave the path for what happened on January 6th by mounting challenges based on these election lies. But what about the others, not ride or die, the mainstream Republicans? How would they vote? Do you remember what former Congresswoman Liz Cheney told me about why only 10 House Republicans voted to impeach Trump in the House for his role in the insurrection? There were members who told me that they were afraid for their own security, afraid, you know, in some instances for their lives. And that tells you something about where we are as a country. That's if terrifying. members of Congress aren't able to, to cast votes or feel that they can't because of their own security. In a recent book, Senator Mitt Romney shared similar anecdotes. Quote, one Republican congressman confided to Romney that he wanted to vote for Trump's second impeachment, but chose not to out of fear for his family's safety. Why put his wife and children at risk if it wouldn't change the outcome? A member of Republican Senate leadership was talked out of voting to convict Trump in the Senate. Quote, you can't do that, Romney recalled someone saying. Think of your personal safety, said another. Think of your children. The senator eventually decided they were right, unquote. Now, how do you think those fears might impact votes after this hypothetical assassination of a political rival? We're in a dangerous place right now as a country. A major swath of the United States has been lied to repeatedly by Republican leaders and MAGA media, such as Fox, people who know better, but who have bet on power over principle. So for all the people who have put their own personal ambition ahead of what's right, they will ultimately have to answer the same questions that I had to answer after my decision in 2016. Those questions don't ever leave. In fact, they're really stubborn. They stay. Former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie looked out at Capitol Hill on January 7th, 2021, and he hated what he saw, and he hated the role he felt he had played in it, and he feared that what might come next would be worse. I remember what Benjamin Franklin said when he was walking down the street in Philadelphia after the Constitutional Convention, and a woman approached him on the street and said, Mr. Franklin, what kind of government did you give us? And he said to the woman, a republic, if you can keep it. Can we?